So Ellen, tell us your story. Well, the reason I'm here is that I want to uh, learn more about um, the Celtic's perspective on the final that Feyenoord played against Celtic for the European Cup in 1970, um, which wasn't uh, a game that you really want to be rem reminded of. Um, but I'm working on a book since next uh, next season, it's 50 years ago, that Feyenoord was the first Dutch uh, team to win the European Cup. Uh, so to compare it to you, that this was our Lisbon in 1970, you had yours in 67, we had ours in 1970. So what I'm trying to do, me and my co-writer are um, find, trying to find as much evidence and relics as possible to um, bring back that season, to bring back the feeling and the experience of that season. So that's why I'm here to hear all the stories of people who've been to um, Milan to um, uh, to see the game and to hear what their expectations were. I think when we think about Lisbon, um, you know, we've just celebrated our 50th anniversary a few years back. The San Siro game, the 1970 game, uh, for many years was almost airbrushed out of Celtic's history. And when you speak to the players, like you mentioned there uh, just a moment ago, they barely wish to speak about the game. Yeah. Uh, there's a huge amount of regret among Celtic fans who were there and yeah. the players who were involved. But we had gone through a massive transition, Celtic. Five years previous to that, Jock Steen had come into the club as the manager. Yeah. And since then, we built ourselves up to win the European Cup and then this was our second final. Yeah. What was the prelude to that final for Feyenoord? Had you been building up to that? Was this just the beginning of something for Feyenoord in terms of success? Well, it's been it's been the glory years of uh, Feyenoord since the 60s because they uh, started getting more players in and they started uh, building a stronger midfield. That's what they always say was just the secret. They got uh, guys like Renier Krijemaat and all the players who made a stronger midfield. That happened in the 60s. The, then we started winning prizes. And then, well, in, in 69, this guy called Ernst Hoppel came in and he made sure that the team was strong enough to finally get this European Cup to, to the Netherlands. Mm -hmm. This is, when we look back, this is total football and, and people tell us about the, the fantastic Dutch teams who trailblazed through the World Cups and uh, Ajax. Sometimes I feel that finally don't get the same recognition. Would I be safe to say that? Yeah, that's what, yeah. Thank you for saying that. <laughs> because, well... I only just realized that after Feyenoord won this European Cup, then Ajax won them several times. Um, and I have to say, I'm so Feyenoord focused that I didn't even think about the Ajax thing. But now that I've come to Glasgow and you get a, a proper, you, you zoom out a little bit and people say, this is when, well, yeah, what you say, Dutch football um, became um, well known. Mm -hmm. So... At, I think Feyenoord might have started it, but what bothers me most is that if you ask people over here who was the first Dutch team to win the European Cup, they will say Ajax. And right. that bothers me, yeah, mm -hmm. because it was Feyenoord, of course. And you're here to spread the word. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. I'm on a mission. Yeah. 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 Over the last few days, you've spoken to various Celtic figures. Yeah. Um, you're steeping yourself in Celtic history. You're yeah. speaking to historians, ex-players, you're taking the tour. Yeah. What have you found? Are there any similarities between the two clubs? Yeah, a lot. I feel at home over here, especially because Glasgow is also second city. Rotterdam is second city. Um, and the way you talk about your team is just the same way we talk about the team. It's a, it's a, um, it's a working class. Um, so Feyenoord is a working class club, um, as Celtic is too. Um, it's a people's club, um, the way you are humble is also a thing I think. Fine is what we always say is first show it and then maybe you can brag about it but not too much. So you just do the job and you do it as best as good as you can and don't brag about how good you are. Um, and I think that Celtic is the same, mm. just be humble, just do it <laughs> and that's what Fine Art is too. So. I think there's a lot of similarities and yeah. I think there's also a friendship between Celtic, uh, uh, that's the reason why there's all, also friendships between the Celtic supporters and Feyenoord supporters. Mm -hmm. And I think, I'm not sure yet, I haven't found the evidence, but I think that started in 1970 because there was respect between the supporters. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting you said that Celtic and Feyenoord are the, 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 
the teams of the classes, the working classes. Yeah. And obviously our great foes are probably the antithesis of that, the complete opposite, where are they're the establishment clubs yeah. and they are quite happy to voice their opinions and shout from the rooftops how great they are. Yeah. Um, and you've seen that yourself coming over to, to Glasgow and seeing the, the kind of Celtic-minded people that you've met. Yeah. When we also look at that final, one of the, the big things for me was that uh, Vim Janssen played for the final team, yeah. played for a great Dutch team. And many, many years later, he played a big part in the Celtic history. Yeah. So, what's your at this moment in time, where is Vim Janssen? Is he still involved with Feyenoord? Well, he, no, he's not involved as in uh, that he's still working for Feyenoord. But he comes in every now and then just to drink a cup of tea with former Spongeman, with Gerard Meijer. So, first I have to say, I was happy to find out that... Uh, Bim Janssen made up a little bit for that last final. So when he came back, he made up a little bit for 1970. Mm. So I felt a bit more safe to come to come here and talk about that final. Um, but Bim Janssen is not, uh, f- f- for as far as I know, not active in football anymore. But I walked into him the other day when I was at the stadium and our former sponge man, is, he has a little museum in the stadium. And um, um, I was invited in there by another former player and there he just was sitting there drinking his tea catching up with his former spongeman so he's he's still got a big fine at heart i think Brilliant. we do forgive him by the way we do. Uh, <laughs> because obviously he won the league but he brought henrik larson over also which yeah. is another good link to, yeah. to find out what's your memories or what kind of legacy did henrik leave at fine i think well um what i remember of him is that he was one happy player that he was just a positive vibe in the team and um, I have to say by that time I just started uh, going to the final games and just started being interested in final and I was always distracted I couldn't watch the field too long because I always was distracted by what was happening in the stadium so I can't tell you if he was a tactically well player but he was I don't think there's many people who who be negative about him so yeah, I think you were lucky to have him after he left final. Yeah, I think we got probably the him at the peak of his powers yeah. when he came to Celtic. Yeah. After a few seasons, he developed into a, a real superstar for Celtic. Yeah. And it was a wrench for him to leave. But uh, obviously he went on to bigger things by winning the Champions League. Yes. Uh, when we are talking about Champions League, I still call it European Cup. Yeah. We were the first British club. Feyenoord were the first Dutch club. Yes. Let's go back to that game for a moment. You'll be meeting some of the, the Celtic players who were involved. It's a huge regret for everybody that was involved, every fan that was at the game, yeah. that Celtic didn't win. Um, but every player I've spoken to, Ellen, they always say, you know, let, let's forget about the excuses. Feyenoord were the better team yeah. on the day. Yeah. Um, what's the plans to celebrate the 50th anniversary when it comes around? Yeah, that's a good question because my co-writer is going to talk to some people at Feyenoord this week, so we're not sure yet what mm-hmm. they're going to do. Mm-hmm. Or whether they have any plans yet, so but we've got plans because we we just thought we need to we need to do something about this mm-hmm. because it's been so important for the identity of Feyenoord for the 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 fact that we were the first to win this important prize mm-hmm. it just gives us still gives us a proud feeling so me and my co-writer just thought we need to start doing this and I'm, I don't know what Feyenoord is going to do right. No. So you could maybe suggest that uh, they bring Celtic over and we can maybe play a game. That would be so cool. You know, I've been talking to Pat Woods these days. You, you know him, uh, mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. I think. And uh, he said the same. He said, you should just have a replay or whatever. It, it would be really cool. That yeah. would be excellent to go yeah. over and, and celebrate yeah. a, a great achievement. I want to have um, a reunion with the players. and That would be yeah, great. Would that be cool. would be great. Yeah. I mean, when we look at the team... Uh, David Hay played for Celtic, he played mm-hmm. uh, number two right back. Him and Vim Janssen became a management team yeah. uh, much later on yeah. in the 1997-98 season. And um, David told me that he never ever once spoke to Vim Janssen about the 70 Cup final. It was so hard for them to yeah. accept. Um, and at that time Celtic had um, commercial deals set up and part of that was that uh, they were to go into a Glasgow recording studio and record a victory song and as far as I know they recorded a victory song yeah. so a wee bit presumptuous but uh, obviously it was never released I want to find that one you should uh, it'll be somewhere in the archives yeah. um, when we talk about the Celtic team of that era uh, I keep banging on about Celtic 
becoming a European superpower. Mm -hmm. We had, um, within 12 seasons, reached at least the quarterfinals of a European competition nine times. Yeah. And in between that was the lost final. So you probably got us at our, our, you know, our best and you toppled us. Yeah. After that, there's a Celtic teddy bear that I believe is now in Rotterdam. It's even in the Feyenoord Museum. It's in the museum. Yes, Could you tell is. us, where, where did that come from? What's the origins of that? Um, uh, the story is that the, uh, the daughter of uh, one of the managers from Feyenoord uh, uh, was given the bear, the teddy bear, by one of the supporters because he said, well, it didn't bring us much luck, so here you go. So she brought it back and it was it was there all the time because we put it in the cup. Mm -hmm. So when, when there was this... Um, um, when the the players got to the uh, to the town hall, to to get cheered at, how do you call it? Because they were, yeah. So the fans could cheer at them, mm -hmm. and then the cup the cup was presented, and the bear the teddy bear was in there, and now it's in the museum. So we just keeping it as our yeah our lucky charm. <laughs> That I joined the um, um, the Hunt in Hunt. That's the the fan magazine. That's the supporters magazine, uh, which we make for the um, uh, supporters association. So it's the official supporters association. They have got a lot of members, and they've got their own magazine. And I'm writing for them. And um, just last year, last season, I've been writing a series of stories about the players' scrapbooks because it was the 110th anniversary of Feyenoord because we were founded in 1908, so a little bit later than you were. Um, and I thought, if I go into these players' scrapbooks, I might find out more about Feyenoord's history, but from the players' perspectives and, uh, um, and the things we, we don't know yet. And then I realized that there's so many hidden treasures mm -hmm. because what they said, yeah, yeah, I should have my scrapbooks somewhere in the attic or wherever. And I found so many good things, like there was this letter that the, um, the players received in the beginning of season from 1969, which said, yeah, you're supposed to be there and there at this and this time to meet your new uh, uh, trainer, and his name is called, uh, his name is Ernst Hoppel, and everyone was like, oh, okay, we'll see. Well, now we know, everyone knows who Ernst Hoppel is, but by then you didn't, so that's all these little treasures that are hidden in in the houses of these yeah. former players. Mm -hmm. So that's when I started thinking like, shit, we, we, we've got to make sure that we, that, that these don't get thrown away because these guys are getting older and older. You don't know if their children see how much these scrapbooks and all the other stuff is worth. So that's when I thought we need to make a book on this. And then I realized, wait a minute, next season is 50 years ago that we won the cup. Yeah. And then, my co-writer was walking around with the same ID because he had been collecting all um, stuff that supporters had kept from that year, from that season. So one and one is two, and now we're just working on the book. When are you expecting to finish the book? Well, the 6th of May <laughs> has to be because that's when the final was. Yeah. So next year, 6th of May, it should be finished. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's a real labour of love, but I think when you started speaking about the scrapbooks, I've been in a similar situation when you're in a a former player's house or a fan's house and they start digging out relics that you know so you get you excited but you know they're they're used to it so they don't they don't care so much yeah. but the scrapbooks are a great way um of unearthing some information that perhaps wasn't in the in the press at the time yeah. um and isn't that greatly known and i think one of the things we were speaking about before is uh, there may well be color footage of the 1970 final um, and I know how people's memories and minds play tricks on them, yeah. but a friend of mine's father was involved in a camera crew who went over from Scotland to film the game in Italy, and he recalls watching the footage in colour. So we're going to try and do some um, digging and some investigation for you to see if we can dig that out, and fabulous. hopefully you can show it on your 50th anniversary. That would be so cool. You should feel my heart now, like, oh, is that, if that exists... I, I can. I think we can. We can get a cinema night that people will come to the cinema to see it mm -hmm. in color. Come on. I know it's. You know, before now that the footage has never been seen really. Yeah. I think they uh, they'll be in an archive somewhere. But as I say, a friend of mine may well have that in a dusty box in an attic somewhere. So let's have a look and see so if it's there. Cool. Yeah. Going back to the game itself, um, I've done some research on the game uh, for one of my books, and there was a great sense of regret 
obviously from the players. When you look at the run that Celtic had leading up to that game, where we, we defeated Benfica, Fiorentina, Leeds United, yeah. um, in many ways it was a much more difficult run yeah. than the 1967 yeah. uh, campaign. But I, th- I felt that Celtic uh, Celtic's final was almost the semi-final. It was the final before the big game. Leeds, um, yeah. There was talk of us underestimating Feyenoord, but obviously Feyenoord came out all guns blazing and you know won that game fair and square. What was the Feyenoord run to that game? Was it as difficult as the Celtic run? Well, we beat Milan, mm. who was the champion at that time. So <laughs> I think yeah. we started with Reykjavik, which was well, a fun game. 12-2 it was the first one and the second one we were just a bit more quiet and just to give them a fun game too maybe and then there was uh, Milan yeah and then well the first one we didn't win but then we did and mm-hmm. well <laughs> you could have said that was our final yeah but yeah. we kept on playing so. precisely yeah Helenio Herrera who was Inter Milan manager uh, that Jockstein defeated in 67 yeah. uh, after the Leeds United game uh, warned Steen via the press Did he, uh, yeah. to look out for Feyenoord because he fancied them yeah. uh, quite strongly uh, to give Celtic a game. So, you know, I think the, the, the best team won on the day and all the excuses um, that have been made since then are, are just that. Although it did start the, the real breakup of the Lisbon Lions and yeah. uh, this new crop of players started coming through for Celtic. And what happened was uh, one of the players that came through uh, shortly thereafter was Kenny Dalglish. They were part of the Quality Street gang. But by the time uh, Dalglish came to fruition, he realised that Celtic weren't going to win the European Cup again, yeah. coming into the late 70s. And he went to English football. Um, and obviously, you know, in 77, he signed for Liverpool. In 78, he won the European Cup. And so it was proven. Um, another Dutch player done exactly the same, Virgil van Dijk, uh, in more recent times. He left, obviously, not just for the money, but to further his career. Yeah. But we're sitting here, and we're, we're fans of very proud football clubs with great uh, European uh, pedigree but we're almost on the outside looking in now when we look at the Champions League yeah. uh, you know the, the final just recently it wasn't a great game to watch but there's two teams who didn't win their league yeah. we're talking about runs to the 1970 final where you had to beat the champions of the respective countries it, it were the best teams the in best Europe teams, at that moment yeah. Yeah. so how do you feel I know that Ajax done particularly well this season it's bittersweet for Celtic fans because we don't have a great relationship with, with their fans <laughs> Um, but as, as a, a team like Feyenoord, a team like Celtic, what do you see the future holding for for clubs like us? Will we ever be at the you know the table of the Champions League? I'm afraid not, because uh, at the moment I think that modern football spoils it all. It's just there's there's in every country you have this one team who wins everything, so who has the most money, so he's way ahead of the others. So there's no more fun. So I think that what a Celtic and Feyenoord should do is just focus on, on making a strong team as strong as possible and don't compare themselves with Barcelona or whatever. Just just make sure that they've got a strong team, the best team they can build and don't focus on, yeah, in 67 for you and in 70 we, we won that cup so we should do it again. Mm-hmm. I think we should just focus on doing the best we can at this moment because, well, modern football is just completely... Spoiled. It's just not what it used to be anymore. No, it's it's kind of tore the soul out of the um, the European Cup for me. Yeah. Uh, and I think Celtic as a fan base, because of our uh, heritage in, in Europe, um, still wish to be involved in that. Yeah. Um, but now it's become obviously just for the bank balance rather than actually getting anywhere near winning it. Yeah. Ajax were a bit of an anomaly this season. How did that happen? What what has been happening in Amsterdam? Um, to create the run that they enjoyed this season. This is not my favourite subject, of no. course. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not really a football analytic, but what I... Okay, so this is just... What I think what they've done really well is that they've been working uh, on this for years. So they made sure they got their players ready for it and they didn't think, okay, we have to win it right now, but they just took their time to improve and they took the young players and... I think they just had a dream and they're just working on it. Just stop boring, like, okay, we we want to do something great, which means we have to work on it mm-hmm. for a long time, which means we don't win any prizes in between. And then, well, see, that's where it gets you. Yeah. 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 And, and I always look at Dutch football as uh, being grassroots. 
you know, producing your own players yeah. and often building great teams, but their teams seem to be split up very quickly because, you know, the vultures of the, the richer leagues will come along and, and buy all your best players. Yeah, true, and um, they've got enough money so they can buy a whole new team again. So mm-hmm. that's what new football is like. Yeah, Absolutely. that's a shame. Yeah. But I'm so hoping for final to finally see that they should uh, use their own talents because there's so many talented guys right now mm-hmm. walking around... Um, who are willing to to play for fi- for the first team of Feyenoord and who are really talented and you should just make sure that they stay and that they feel connected to the club and they mm-hmm. just want to do everything. That's what you need because that's what the guys from 1970 also said. They said Feyenoord will never be able to do this again. So the old guys say that because they say um, we stayed together for years. Some of them have been playing together for for eight ten years. Yeah. So they were a, 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 a real team. But now people leave after two or three years because yeah, they right. think they can make money somewhere mm-hmm. else. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We've been speaking about fan culture yeah. and um, obviously our proud European heritage, but it's changed so much in the modern day. Uh, but there was one great interview given by Jurgen Klopp, either leading up or after the European Cup one uh, recently, where he was speaking about the, the range of emotions that they share with the fans. Cool. It's, it sounded as though he got it. He gets what what we're all about, which and, is quite special. Yeah, and why you've got a finer state of mind, and I've got a Celtic state of mind. Yeah. How do you think that's changed in the modern day with the greed and the money and the Champions League and the corruption of FIFA? And how has it changed now with, with with people going to the games these days? Well, that changed. People don't go to the games anymore. Mm-hmm. So um, what you see now is that well, I've been talking about to pet boots, but we've got uh, at finals we've got our own pet boots kind of people. And they love their club to bits, but they won't go to the stadium anymore because they're fed up with the modern uh, football and all the all the rules, and, and it's not their team anymore. But the feeling for the club for the for Feyenoord stays the same. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. you don't have to go to the stadium to still love your club. Yeah, do you think there's been a lot of um, emotion lost in terms of when I was introduced to Celtic? It was passed down from generation to generation. It wasn't. Uh, a fashion accessory yeah. to go and watch Celtic, yeah. but it's become a fashion accessory to go and watch these English Premier League clubs, hasn't it? Yeah, but it's worse over, over here, I think, for you, because <laughs> I hope we're not going to do what, what English and mm. Scottish football is up to. Um, because in the Netherlands, I still tend to think that people are there for the club and they're still emotionally involved. Mm-hmm. We're not like the Barcelona yet. But what you see is happening is that more and more people in the Netherlands start supporting, uh, uh, let's say, Liverpool or Barcelona or whatever. And I just don't get it because it's, I don't get it how you get connected to these teams when they're so far away, when there's a beautiful football team in your own town, which you can just, where you can go to, you can buy tickets and just see the players play. I just don't get it why they choose, uh, why they don't feel the connection to the team that is closest to them. I'm not sure why that is. Mm-hmm. Well, I think when we look at Feyenoord, and uh, I've learned a lot speaking to you about the kind of roots of the club and, yeah. and the fan movement, uh, there are so many similarities between Feyenoord and, and the, the core of what Celtic is. Now, yeah. Celtic is has turned into a massive corporate organisation. Yeah. Um, and part of that is the fact that uh, I think previously we were a great football uh, team Mm-hmm. But we weren't run properly as a as a club, or as a as a business, if you like, yeah. and we'll never allow that that to happen again. Yeah. But it can go so far that there's a, a lack of engagement, if you like. There's a disconnect between the club and the fans. Yeah. Is that something that at the moment Feyenoord um, haven't gone down that road? So are you guys still yeah. quite close to the club? Yeah, but I have to say this: this is what we, this is our nightmare. What you're telling me, because what's happening right now, it's been happening for ten years. We've been talking about building a new stadium for Feyenoord, mm-hmm. and um, uh, it still hasn't happened because it's a lot of money involved, way too much money. And what you see is there's a lot of people who don't like the the plan for the new stadium that's there right now, because it's um, it's all based on uh, becoming a club like a Barcelona or whatever, who who attracts more people who just come there for fun just for as a day trip or something and who aren't connected to the club anymore so this is what we're really scared of so this whole stadium thing is really like a dark cloud um above the club right now 
would it still be in Notre Dame, the, the actual stadium? Yeah, yeah, it, yeah. Will, it will actually be just close to where the stadium mm -hmm. is right now. Mm -hmm. So the plan is, well, okay, I can imagine that after the stadium was built in 1937, so okay, I can imagine that you want to make it more modern or something. And the plan is quite okay, they want to build it at the riverside, well, that's, that's quite cool. But they forget about football culture, they just want to turn it into... Well, the next thing, so you can pick what are we going to do tonight? Are we going to go to a musical or are we going to go to the Feyenoord Stadium? Like, it's, it's more, it's becoming more entertainment yeah. or something. And it's not, to us, it's a matter of life and death. But exactly. they just want to sell tickets as if it's just another show or something. Mm -hmm. yeah. Sell the seat and then spend as much money while you're in the stadium. That's it. Like yeah. a tourist attraction. Yeah. You're absolutely right. But I think you're killing your club if you do that. Because the, the, the real supporters... You see, what I call real supporters are the ones that really feel the connection, that really feel the pain when you lose the game. That's, I think, is real supporters. Mm -hmm. um, if they stop going to the game, you don't have the same atmosphere in your stadium anymore. So it's no use for these people who want to see a show to go to the stadium. So I think you should always make sure that the supporters who are there for the, and uh, who make sure that there's the right atmosphere, you should always make sure that they keep coming because that's the core of your club. That's why you exist, I think. It's a heartbeat. A yeah, club, yeah, yeah, well said. Yeah. Now you came over and um, you are learning about Celtic traditions and history <laughs> and you brought us some gifts. You brought us a, a beautiful Fanyard <laughs> pennant which will uh, make an appearance on the Celtic State of Mind videos from yeah. time to time. But you also brought something for us to enjoy. So could you tell us about... Uh, these delicacies that you brought over. Yeah, I bought you some cookies, which has nothing to do with football, I have to say. But I'm originally from Gouda, and Gouda is known for the cheese. But I thought no cheese because it's smelly in your in your suitcase. <laughs> so I brought you stroopwafels, the cookies from Gouda. Um, uh, and you just have to try them. They're nice and sweet. They're good. And I have to say, there's only two finer players who came from Gouda, so there's nothing to do with the football, but they are good. <coughs> <laughs> oh, the camera and wants one too. <laughs> Just you can never come over without doing anything. So enjoy. So much appreciated. Thank you very much <laughs> for appearing on Celtic State of Mind. It's been an absolute pleasure.